Jeff Seifers, CEO of Sonoma Clean Power, is up next to help us think big and answer the question, why, what are we here for? For nearly 20 years, Jeff helped utilities, public agencies, and businesses develop and manage renewable energy and energy efficiency programs. A licensed engineer and a pioneer in the green building field, Jeff has consulted on more than $1 billion of completed projects. He was founding director of Kema Sustainable Buildings and Communities and was chief sustainability officer for the first One Planet community in North America. He's the innovative thinker and make it happen leader of Sonoma Clean Power. Please help me welcome Jeff Cyphers. Thank you, Anne and Barry and everyone for the Center for Climate Protection. This is, uh, this is exciting to watch what a J-curve looks like. That's what we are right now. Um, at Sonoma Clean Power, we're immensely proud of what we've accomplished over the last four years. We're an old timer now. We've been serving customers for four years. And it's pretty wild to think that we're an old timer. Um, we have financed almost $2 billion of construction of new renewables and power supply contracts that is diverse, that emphasizes base load, that focuses on evening hours and flexibility, that has half the emissions, a little less than half the emissions of PG&E's mix. We've provided over $15 million of incentives for electric vehicle programs to customers and given away 1,800 free home electric vehicle chargers. Uh, we've saved over $80 million on customer bills, and what I want to identify is that in short, we've delivered on the, the hope, the mission that our customers created for us when they created us. And together, collectively, we've been able to create better public oversight of the private energy market. We've been able to negotiate lower costs on supply contracts and stabilize customer rates. We've been able to reduce customer risk by making sure that we bought the right amount of energy and the right kinds. We've delivered on the dream of Migden's Assembly Bill 117 back in 2002, following the energy crisis, to make electricity markets less risky and more stable to protect ratepayers. So we've also delivered on the mission the lawmakers set out for us when they created us. And that's great, but let's get real for a minute. We've been perpetuating a myth, too. It's time that we sharpen our story. We've been talking a lot about the competition we bring against the investor-owned utilities offerings. And that's BS. I just want to call it out. CCAs don't really compete with investor-owned utilities because investor-owned utilities aren't allowed to compete with us. They can't lose. When we generate electricity for their customers and, and take their customers, they can't lose profit. Their investors cannot lose. Uh, and since we can't take the electricity grid, the delivery services, away from the investor-owned utilities, at least for now, they <laughs> can't lose either. Their side of the business is protected. And so I want to I wanna identify um, some, some key differences that CCAs have that are distinct from that because some of the benefits of what CCAs provide today could be provided by investor-owned utilities. The legislature could reduce how much greenhouse gas emissions their portfolios can have. The CPUC could require them to better manage their portfolios. All of that could happen, and we actually encourage that to happen. But I want to I wanna talk today for a minute about some value that CCAs have that's inherent that investor-owned utilities should never be expected to have, regardless of what policy is in Sacramento, regardless of what the CPUC has. And it really comes down to something that has nothing to do with competition. The competition we have is about the wholesale energy market, not between us and, and the IOU. So let me talk about that inherent value. In October 2017, a firestorm devastated the North Bay. And so in our service territory alone, 5,200 homes were lost. And it was staggering. Within a month, um, some customers of ours, our staff, brought forward a proposal and they said, we're going to be rebuilding entire neighborhoods. Let's rebuild them better than they were before. 
Let's look at how do we rebuild neighborhoods without having to introduce natural gas back into those neighborhoods. Let's look at rebuilding neighborhoods that are super energy efficient and that which don't cost more to construct because we're actually covering that incremental cost. So our staff and others challenged us to raise at least $20 million fast and design a program that would provide incentives. And what happened was kind of amazing. Uh, we wanted to do something that went beyond where Title 24 is going in 2020. So the, the Building Energy Code of California in 2020, and they deserve a lot of applause for this, is going to a true net zero uh, program where homes need solar, where the energy efficiency is, is very strong. And we wanted to take it one step further so that we could showcase where the energy code should go after the 2020 code update in 2022 or even beyond. So we wanted to create the, the living laboratory. And so what that meant to us was no longer net zero, but just zero. What if we could build carbon-free homes that didn't require net metering, that didn't require dependency on trading and producing more than you need in the middle of the day and taking it back in the evening hours so that it becomes a sustainable model that everyone could replicate. So we sat down to scope it out and it turned out that's actually simpler than net metering. Net metering is wicked complicated. How many people in the room have to answer customer questions about bills on net metering? I pity you. <laughs> it's way too complicated. So when we scoped it out, we thought, okay, if we can provide the incentives for no gas connection to the home, for beating the current energy code by at least 20%, focusing on evening hour efficiency, one of the real keys there, installing EV charging everywhere so that you can have electric transportation, and then sourcing all electricity from 24-7 renewable sources. That was it. That was the plan. And that last bullet sounds tricky, but it turns out We've known how to do it since the 60s, and the old way to do it was solar with a big battery bank. That's still an option, and actually storage is, is coming down in prices, and that, that is an option, and so it's one of the options we offered. The other was to use our evergreen service from Sonoma Clean Power, which uses geothermal at night, solar in the daytime, and we're looking to add more sources to that as well. But importantly, the shaping, the resource adequacy, all of that is coming from a carbon-free resource. So that's a 24-7 uh, option. The estimated cost, we figured, ranged between $12,000 and $17,500 for that upgrade. So we said, all right, let's offer $17,500. There's no excuses. Let's see who shows up and takes advantage of this program. So the Advanced Energy Rebuild Program was born. And this was about three months ago that we had our design criteria all lined up. We had our budget lined up. We figured what we knew we had to do but we needed money and data and contacts and tons of people on the ground. We needed people to go out and meet with architects and contractors. We had to reach thousands of people who we didn't have their phone numbers anymore or their addresses because they were all displaced. We had to somehow connect to the community. And in literally three days after our program idea was designed, we realized we needed PG&E because they had all of that. So you might imagine that going to ask PG&E for help on a program that was intended to not reintroduce gas to a neighborhood was going to be a non-starter. <laughs> they sell gas. <laughs> you might imagine that you know, going to PG&E and asking for help on coming up with a model that obviates, it eliminates the need for net metering when they've complained and others have complained about departing load and how that's adding risk to the system for the remaining customers. And I was amazed that really, after just a few phone calls, they said, yeah, we want to work with you. This sounds really important, and it sounds like the right thing to do after uh, such a big tragedy. So what followed was a few more months of collaboration that was incredibly intense. We raised money together. We, we came up with, we're just shy of $20 million. So if you got about 800000 let me know. Um, we, we called every fire survivor. We held um, dozens and dozens of meetings with the folks who'd lost homes, uh, with contractors, with architects. We're still ramping that up, and so we aim to have over 100 meetings along those lines just in this year alone. And uh, we designed a series of classes on how to build zero carbon, not just net zero. And in short, it worked. The collaboration of a CCA with an investor-owned utility working side by side. 
But let's pause for a second to talk about why it worked. So Sonoma Clean Power is a local organization. We hold our meetings within under eight miles of most of our customers who can bus or drive there or bicycle, they can get to a meeting. We hold our meetings in plain language. We, you know, we explain complicated terms like resource adequacy at any chance anybody asks. Um, we are an accessible agency that has at least 150 public events every year where we're out in the community. We're at every one of those events. We don't sponsor events we don't attend. So we go there, we're out in the community, we uh, are present, and any time an idea comes up that is even remotely related to energy, we hear about it usually on the same day, the next day maybe. So we are, we are locally connected, we are innovative, we are able to run and design programs that CPUC doesn't allow the investor-owned utilities to do. We can do fuel shifting. You can too. <laughs> you know, we can actually design a program and launch it in 60 to 120 days. Uh, that's unheard of at the state level when you're using CPUC funds. So we're locally connected and we're able to innovate. But we do not have trucks or the kinds of engineers that pg e has. We don't have the detailed system data needed to plan an all-electric service. We don't have intimate knowledge of grid safety for provisions of distribution equipment. And we don't have ready-made classes on zero carbon construction ready to roll out at a moment's notice. And the bottom line was that to launch something as audacious as the advanced energy rebuild, we needed to have both CCAs and IOUs working together. And so we're better suited to identify local community needs, and I argue that your CCA is as well. They are better suited to prepare the poles and wires for our carbon-free future. We're, we are better suited to integrate electricity planning with local agencies like our transportation authority and our water authority. We talk to them monthly. They are better planned or better situated to plan the interface of the distribution system with the uh, transmission grid. We're better at in innovating and running programs that the CPUC won't let anyone else run. Uh, things like uh, grid savvy, where we actually are managing a real-time dispatch, or we're setting it up to manage a real-time dispatch of 1,800 electric vehicle chargers so that we can provide resource adequacy from a local resource. Um, they're better at managing proven cost-effective programs that the CPUC has set up. And so maybe some of these things will shift over time, but one thing won't. And, and that is that CCAs will always be at the forefront of identifying local community needs and making sure they're addressed. So here it is, your challenge for the day. What will make your CCA valuable through the next energy crisis? Why do you need to exist? Assume the legislature and the CPUC make those changes. They make sure that the IOUs are getting greener and cleaner and so forth. And my pitch is that you identify a mission that connects you with all other local efforts. Nothing's off the table. So Sonoma Clean Power's mission is to provide affordable, reliable, zero carbon energy for all human purposes. And we interpret that to mean that we're responsible for transportation emissions, water pumping, zoning rules on housing. Not primarily responsible, there are other agencies that have the primary responsibility. But we, we're not exempt from contributing to that effort. We have to show up when there's an affordable housing project that's having trouble getting built downtown. So do you have a mission that goes beyond just building new renewables, that actually looks at reliability, that looks at your local needs and connects to your local community? If you don't, I challenge you to start building one. And connect the dots. CCAs are uniquely situated to address local community needs. And we need to create clean ways to support grid reliability not just clean energy, and that's the new game. So I wanna hear your story next. Maybe today, what's your mission? Thank you. <laughs>